Welcome. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, this is our inaugural event for Harvard Law Students for Life. My name is Chase Giacomo. I'm a 2L here at Harvard Law School and the president of Harvard Law Students for Life. I just want to go through a few administrative notes and introduce our group for a second, and then we'll bring up the main event, uh, Dr. George. First off, uh, if you look at my left and my right, you can see we have a URL up here. If you want to sign up for our mailing list, uh, you can click on that. There's also a, a paper sign up in the back by the food. Uh, there, you don't have to be a member to get our emails, but you can also, there's a button you can click that will allow you to uh, become a member as well. A few administrative notes. I apologize, we went through 90 sandwiches like that. We weren't expecting uh, as much of the turnout that, that, there, that there is. Um, so I apologize. Uh, this will be recorded, this event. Uh, you couldn't tell from the huge camera in the back. So just be aware that it will be posted on our social media sites. Uh, this is a good time to silence your cell phones if you have them. And uh, just one other note, you know, ab abortion is a sensitive topic. We understand that. We just ask that you'd be respectful uh, to our speaker, but also to your fellow audience members. So with that, I'll just talk about our group a little bit before I pass it off. Um, Law Students for Life is a, oh, feels like I lost my mic here. Uh, Law Students for Life is an up-and-coming organization here at Harvard Law School. We'll be applying in the fall to be an official student organization. Fortunately, Harvard allows us to host an event to show viability. Uh, when we were forming the group, there was kind of some pushback at first. There was, there was kind of this idea that maybe there was only three or four students at Harvard that cared about you know, pro-life issues or that wanted to um, debate and discuss the topic. And within a few weeks, we were able to prove that, that is, that's not the case. We had an overwhelming amount of students sign up to be members of our organization. And we had students who just wanted to be on our mailing list in order to uh, partake in, in debate and conversation with us. And if you look around the room today and, and, and you think about the fact that we ran out of 90 sandwiches like that, uh, I think it's clear that we're going to be able to um, have an, a big impact here at Harvard Law School. So our goal of the group is really to, to advocate for pro-life perspectives in the broader law school community. And that, you know, we want to take a holistic approach to that. We want to, we, you know, we don't want to just talk about the moral and philosophical legal arguments. We also want to talk about the scientific arguments and everything to include, you know, talking about what can we do as a society to create a pro-life culture. You know, how can we help those that are in tough situations facing this decision? Um, and on that note, I'll do, a, I'll do a plug for two weeks from now. If you guys like this event, we want to invite you back. On April 19th, we are co-sponsoring uh, with the Black Law Students Association, uh, Emmy Award winner and co-founder of the Radiance Foundation, Ryan Bomberger. And then Professor Diane Rosenfeld will respond. And then after all that, we'll have some Q&A. So we would love for you to come join us in Balsa on the second floor on April 19th at noon again. It's going to be a, a, a great conversation. The topic is the disproportionate effects of abortion on the black community. So we, we invite you to come join us for that. You know, introducing this group, uh, wouldn't be complete without thanking our faculty advisor. Uh, Professor Marianne Glendon has, has signed on as our faculty advisor. She's been a huge help for us. Uh, you can spend about 10 seconds on Google and realize uh, that Professor Glendon is a, a world-renowned scholar in constitutional law, human rights, uh, law, and, and religious freedom. But what you might not find in 10 seconds on Google is how much her students just value and respect her. So Professor Glennon, on, on behalf of Law Students for Life, we want to thank you. Uh, you've been a guiding light for us here at Harvard Law School and for many before us. So if you guys could give uh, Professor Glennon a round of applause. <laughs> to the main event, I'm, I'm talking a little fast because I want to reserve time for Dr. George. It's, it's, it's really worthwhile. Um, Dr. Robert George is the McCormick Professor of Jurisprudence at Princeton University. He's a visiting professor here at Harvard Law School. He is chairman of the United States Commission on International Religious Freedom. He has served as the president on the President's Council on Bioethics and as a presidential appointee to the United States Commission on Civil Rights. Um, and I invite our Vice President of Operations, Ann Stark, to come up uh, with the award we're going to give Dr. George. And Dr. George, if, if you could come on up as well. So each year, Law Students for Life is going to present uh, a, a speaker uh, with, a, with an award for someone who has devoted a significant portion of their professional life advocating for the rights of the unborn. And when we talked about this award, it was, there was no debate. It was Dr. George, it was Dr. George. But people, you know, when they heard about that, they said, that's great. But you realize he's booked two years out, right? If you guys are planning this for 2018, maybe. 
So we kind of, okay, what do we do if, if we can't get him? And, and they were right. He's in high demand, um, but we were thankful, and we felt very blessed that Dr. George agreed to come here today and set this legacy. And so, uh, Dr. George, thank you on behalf of Lost Students for Life um, for advocating for uh, millions of, of children who've lost their lives to abortion. Uh, we are, it's our pleasure to, provide you, or to uh, give you with our first annual Susan B. Anthony Commitment to Life Award. And with that, I'll turn the floor over to, uh, to Dr. George. Well, thank you, Chase, and thanks to uh, all of you for uh, coming out. I'm very deeply uh, honored to have an award named for Susan B. Anthony, who is uh, one of my great heroes, and to receive the award in the presence of Professor Mary Ann Glendon, who is another of my uh, great heroes uh, and a mentor. Uh, I'm delighted and uh, want to congratulate you on your organization, on Students for Life and the work you do, and for bringing uh, an opportunity to this institution, which is my law alma mater, uh, for these issues to be raised and debated and discussed and reflected on in a very serious way. Obviously, they're very serious issues, and it's very important that all sides of the question uh, be on the table for discussion and seriously uh, engaged. I'm sorry to be sitting down and I'm having some back trouble, so I'm going to uh, offer you uh, my remarks uh, uh, while, while seated uh, today. Since my remarks will <laughs> take up most of the time we have together before uh, some of you and I have to run to class, I've uh, put my uh, email address up on the board. So uh, if you have uh, questions or challenges or just want to shout at me, uh, you can uh, do it at that uh, uh, email address. It, it, I'll try to get back to people as quickly as, uh, as, as I can. If it's an in-depth, detailed uh, question, I, it might take me a few days to uh, get back to you, or even a week or, or more. But I will uh, get back to you. And if I don't, then just uh, uh, poke me again. Well, I want to address not every aspect of the question, because there's certainly not time uh, in the uh, hour that we have together. But I want to address the question that was uh, uh, given as the title of my remarks today. Uh, are human embryos human beings? Are they persons? There are other questions beyond that. Even if everything I say today is true, there are other questions uh, beyond that. Uh, but I'm only going to tackle these today. And I do think these are very fundamental, very fundamental questions for the current debate. We know this just from the controversy that erupted when uh, Marco Rubio, when he was still uh, running for president, uh, said that he believed that the life of a new human being begins at conception. Well, there was a big uproar about it, and at least the beginning of uh, a debate. Not much of a, of, a, of a debate actually happened. A few people uh, weighed in. Uh, the distinguished bioethicist at New York University, uh, my friend and frequent sparring partner, Art Kaplan, uh, weighed in uh, on the subject. Uh, I weighed in with a reply uh, to Professor uh, Kaplan, but uh, there wasn't a great deal uh, beyond that. And I do want to take us beyond that on those questions, the questions of uh, the putative humanity of the human embryo and the putative personhood of the human embryo in my uh, remarks today. The adult human being that is now you or me is the same human being, the same being certainly, who at an earlier stage of his or her life was an adolescent and before that a child an infant, a fetus, and an embryo. Thus, recollecting at her birth his appreciation of Louise Brown, the first so-called test tube baby, recollecting her as two cells in his Petri dish, Robert Edwards, the scientist who pioneered in vitro fertilization, said of Louise, she was beautiful then and she is beautiful now, indicating his appreciation and understanding of the fact that she, the newborn baby, was the same biological reality, the same entity, the same organism, the same being that was the two cells he looked at in the microscope upon successful in vitro. Edwards and his co-author accurately describe the embryonic Louise as, quote, a, microsco a microscopic human being 
one in its very earliest stage of development. They say that the human being in the embryonic stage of its development is, quote, passing through a critical period in its life of great exploration. It becomes magnificently organized, switching on its own biochemistry. Keep in mind now, because I'll come back to this later, the reference to its own, switching on its own biochemistry, increasing in size and preparing itself for implantation in the womb. So even in the embryonic stage, you and I were, quite undeniably from the point of view of human embryology and developmental biology, we're not talking about the Bible here, we're talking about the fundamental works of science relative to this area, you and I were undeniably living members, whole living members of the species Homo sapiens. We were then, as we are now, distinct and complete, though of course in the beginning we were developmentally immature human organisms. The key thing here is that we were not, even then, mere parts of other organisms and no authority whatever in the fields of human embryology and developmental biology attest otherwise. In fact, all attest to the distinctness of the embryo from the earliest stage. Now, by contrast, the gametes, the sperm and egg whose union brings into existence the, em the embryo, are not whole or distinct organisms. You could not say of an oocyte that is a whole living member of the species Homo sapiens at an early developmental stage. Rather, they are functionally, and of course, genetically, identifiable as parts of the male or female potential parents. Each has only half the genetic material needed to guide the development of an immature human being toward full maturity. They're destined either to combine with an oocyte or spermatozoan, an opposite gamete, to generate a new and distinct organism in the case of successful fertilization and embryogenesis, or simply to die. And even when fertilization occurs, these gametes do not survive. You are not uh, a, a, uh, uh, someone who was once an egg or a sperm cell. Rather, their genetic material, the genetic material of the oocyte and spermatozoa and the gametes, enters into the composition of the new being, the new organism. And, and that's going to be true not only in humans, uh, but in other uh, mammals and indeed other animals. But none of what I have just said about the gametes, you'll notice, is true of the embryo. From the zygote and blastula stages, the very earliest stages onward, the single cell stage onward. The combining of the chromosomes of the spermatozoan and the oocyte generates what every work of human embryology attests and identifies as a new, distinct, and enduring organism. Whether produced by fertilization as in normal sexual intercourse, or by somatic cell nuclear transfer, which is the most prominent cloning uh, technique, which may well be perfected. We can discuss the ethics of it sometime, but may well be perfected as a way of creating new human beings. Either way, whether by fertilization, union of gametes, or by somatic cell nuclear transfer upon the activation of the, uh, uh, essentially the ingredients, the uh, uh, somatic cell nucleus uh, that's put into the enucleated ovum. The human embryo possesses all of the genetic material needed to inform and organize its growth. All of it. All of it. None is supplied externally. The direction of its growth is not extrinsically determined, but is in accord with the genetic information within it, which goes back to that uh, point that I emphasized when quoting Robert Edwards about Louise Brown earlier. Nor does it merely possess organizational information for maturation. Rather, it has an active disposition to develop itself using that information. The human embryo is then a whole and distinct human organism, an embryonic member of the species, an embryonic human being. 
Uh, oh, I, uh, one small point, uh, just to footnote. The first, uh, uh, first one or two divisions of the embryo, beginning with the zygote, in the first 36 hours, occur under the direction of messenger RNA acquired from the oocyte. And thereafter, the cleavages are guided by uh, the embryo's own uh, DNA. So you, have a, uh, you do have a contribution of the maternal RNA at the very beginning to launch. If the embryo were not a complete organism, then what could it be? Unlike the spermatozoa and the uh, oocytes, it's not merely a part of a larger organism, namely the mother or the father, nor is it a disordered growth or a gamete tumor, such as a complete hydatidiform mole uh, or uh, a teratoma, uh, entities that can be uh, produced uh, when you have um, failures of fertilization caused by uh, uh, various factors and which no one would identify as an embryonic member of the uh, species or object to uh, cutting out and getting rid of. Now, perhaps someone will say that the early embryo is some kind of an intermediate form, something which regularly emerges into a whole human organism, but for one reason or another isn't one yet. But what could cause the emergence of the whole human organism and cause it with such regularity? As I've already observed, it's clear that from the zygote stage forward, the single cell stage forward, the major development of this organism is controlled and directed from within. That is, by the organism itself, the newly conceived embryo. So after the embryo comes into being, no event or series of events occur which could be construed as the production of a new organism. That is, nothing extrinsic to the developing organism itself acts on the organism to produce a new character or a new development. That development is, once again, guided by the embryo itself. It's internally directed. All right, now, so far what I've done is laid out the scientific case for the status of the embryo from the early stages uh, as a new individual of the species. And uh, as my uh, uh, colleague uh, Peter Singer at Princeton would be quick to point out, uh, he would agree uh, with uh, what I've said thus far with uh, just a minor uh, caveat at a very early stage. Uh, and so he would agree that, in fact, uh, we're talking from the early embryonic stage forward of a uh, living member of the species Homo sapiens. But then he would argue that that doesn't uh, preclude uh, destructive research on human embryos or uh, uh, elective abortion uh, from a moral point of view because he believes the developing human being in the early stages, not just the embryonic and fetal stages, but even the infant stage, uh, is not yet a person uh, and therefore does not yet uh, have um, uh, uh, the dignity that is required for to count uh, in the calculus, the moral calculus uh, by which we determine whether killing is right or wrong. So the next issue I have to address is the question, do embryonic human beings deserve respect? Now, a supporter of elective abortion or embryo-destructive research might concede, as Singer does, that a human embryo, at least pretty early on, or fetus certainly, is a human being in the biological sense, yet deny that human beings in the early stages of their development through infancy, even in Singer's case, are due full moral respect such that they may not be killed to benefit more fully developed human beings who, for example, may be suffering from afflictions, which is the, the justification offered for uh, embryonic stem cell research, research that, research that involves the destruction of human embryos. But to deny that embryonic and fetal human beings deserve full respect, one must, of course, suppose that not every human being deserves full respect. And to do that, one must hold that those human beings who deserve full respect deserve it not in virtue of the kind of entity they are, say a human entity, a rational creature, but rather in virtue of some acquired characteristic that some human beings or some human beings at some stages have and others do not have and which some human beings have in greater degrees, uh, degree than others. And this, in my judgment, and here's where I radically disagree with uh, Professor Singer, uh, is untenable. It's clear, everyone would have to agree, including uh, my colleague Professor Singer, that one need not be actually 
or immediately conscious, reasoning, deliberating, self-aware, making choices and so forth in order to be a human being who deserves full moral respect. For plainly people who are asleep or who are in reversible comas deserve such respect. So if one denied that human beings are intrinsically valuable, valuable in virtue of what they are, human beings, but required an additional attribute beyond being a human being, having some additional qualities that some human beings have and others don't, or some have at some stages and others uh, don't because they're not at those stages, the additional attribute would have to be a capacity of some sort. It would have to be because otherwise we wouldn't be able to account for the dignity or inviolability or rights of people who are in reversible comas or um, uh, semi-conscious states. And it would have to be, of course, a capacity for some sort of mental functioning. Now, of course, human beings in the embryonic, fetal, and early infant stages, as Professor Singer points out, lack immediately exercisable capacities for mental functions characteristically carried out by most human beings at later stages of maturity, like the function that you are carrying out right now in listening to my words, understanding them not just as sounds, but as sounds that have meaning, reflecting on uh, what I'm saying, trying to figure out if you're understanding correctly what I'm saying, uh, trying to evaluate what I'm saying. Does it hold up? Is this right? Is he making a mistake? Is he, if, is he not thinking of, of a counterargument and so forth? Still, even infants or uh, human beings in earlier stages, fetal or embryonic stages, possess in root form, in radical form, these very capacities, precisely by virtue of the kind of entity they are, they are from the beginning actively developing themselves to the stages at which these capacities will, if all goes well, be immediately exercisable. That's that point about self-direction of development toward human maturity that I have been hammering away at and which I uh, emphasized in um, that quotation from uh, Dr. Edwards. So you can compare uh, the human being uh, with a rabbit or uh, with a dog. Uh, certainly uh, the, the, the mature dog is carrying out some mental functions that the uh, newborn infant isn't yet uh, capable of. And yet we know that the human infant is the creature possessing a rational nature, unlike, we think, uh, a dog. Uh, so the um, uh, the human infant or fetus or embryo is from the earliest stages in possession of the capacities that will enable it to develop itself to the point at which it can do things, if all goes well, that dogs uh, can't do, uh, deliberation, judgment, uh, actual uh, choice. And the same would be true with other uh, uh, brute uh, animals. Although, like infants, embryos have not yet developed themselves to a stage at which they can uh, perform uh, intellectual operations, uh, even uh, those that a rabbit or a dog uh, could perform, it's clear that as human beings, as opposed to being rabbits, dogs, or anything else, they are rational animal organisms. That's the kind of entity they are. A human being is a being with a rational nature, and you have that nature from the very beginning, and you have it until the very end. Uh, now, it's possible, of course, that the capacities can be permanently blocked, giving us congenitally, severely, cognitively disabled people. People used to use the term mental retardation uh, to uh, describe. And yet, we recognize them rightly as human beings, that is, creatures with a rational nature, even though the full expression of that nature is blocked by some affliction. And we can understand why that's true simply by doing a thought experiment. If you uh, taught, if you, if you did a transformation, some kind of an, an intervention on a horse and taught the horse to speak, to actually speak in a, in a language like a human being, you would be not perfecting the horse as the kind of creature it is with the kind of nature it has. You're going to be turning that horse into something else. That's no longer a horse, whatever it is. I'm not sure what we would uh, call it at that stage. But if a person suffering from a congenital 
uh, severe congenital uh, cognitive disability uh, can undergo a therapy uh, that is created that uh, conquers the affliction and enables the full expression of uh, his rationality or her rationality to emerge. You have not changed that human being into a different kind of creature or a creature with a different nature. You have perfected that human being as the kind of creature it is, a human being, a rational animal organism. It's important then to distinguish two senses of capacity, or what is sometimes, although I think misleadingly, uh, in the debate referred to as potentiality for mental functions. First, there's an immediately exercisable capacity, like the one we're exercising right now in trying to think through this issue. Which de uh, and then, uh, secondly, there's a basic natural capacity which develops over time, which uh, uh, has to exist in root form from the very beginning, but which unfolds and develops as the creature uh, matures, and which, of course, may be lost uh, in its, uh, uh, not, not in its underlying uh, reality, but in its immediate exercisability by uh, dementia or some other uh, affliction, an Alzheimer's disease or something like that. And there are good reasons for believing that it is the second sort of capacity, the basic root natural capacity, and not the first, the immediately exercisable capacity, that provides the justificatory basis for regarding human beings, all human beings, as ends in themselves, creatures with dignity, and not merely as means, things that can be used for other purposes, such as spare parts. That is, as bearers of inherent dignity and subjects of justice and human rights, and not as mere objects. This would be what would enable us to uh, say, if we are in fact prepared to say it, that we would be morally opposed to a for technology use, the use of a technology that would enable uh, each of us to uh, acquire uh, uh, a set of spare parts in the form of a cloned copy of ourselves. Uh, that's a living member of the human species, a human being, but who we have um, uh, done an intervention early in his life to knock out uh, some of the capacities that we uh, value, the expression of some of the capacities that we value, such as the capacity for deliberation or choice or the uh, enjoyment of uh, art or anything like that. So you've, you've induced a very severe cognitive disability uh, but let the person uh, mature to maintain that person or that human being, the debate would be whether that human being is a person, a as a collection of spare parts to which you can uh, go uh, in case you need, let's say, a new pancreas as a result of pancreatic cancer or uh, a heart transplant or a liver transplant or what have you. Now first, the developing human being, the reason we should I think recognize the root capacity as the foundation of our dignity and not the immediately exercisable capacity. First, the developing human being does not reach a level of maturity at which he or she performs a type of mental act that other animals, rabbits, dogs, and so forth do not perform until at least several months after birth, again, as Professor Singer and others have pointed out. A six-week-old baby lacks the immediately exercisable capacity to perform characteristically human mental functions, the things that dogs and rabbits can't do. So if full moral respect were due only to those who possess immediately exercisable capacities for these characteristically human mental functions, it would follow, of course, that six-week-old infants do not deserve full moral respect and could be used as our spare parts inventory. Indeed, unsentimental believers that full moral respect is due only to those human beings who possess immediately exercisable capacities for these mental functions don't hesitate these days to draw the inference that young infants do not deserve moral respect. And here I would recommend to you Professor Singer's uh, famous article. If you haven't read it, it's easily accessible online from the British journal The Spectator, the article entitled Killing Babies is Not Always Wrong, where Professor Singer makes the case for the moral permissibility uh, of infanticide, uh, especially where um, the killing of the infant could produce a good result by giving you an organ or organ primordia that uh, you need. Thus, if human embryos may be legitimately destroyed to advance biomedical science as an embryo destructive research, then it follows logically that, subject to parental approval, 
the body parts of human infants should be fair game for scientific experimentation. So when Professor Singer was asked in a magazine interview whether there would be anything wrong with a society in which children were bred for spare parts on a massive scale, so long as they were killed in infancy and not later, his reply was simply, no, there would be nothing morally wrong with that society. And that is the right answer if you take the view that what gives the human being or any being dignity is the immediately exercisable capacity for characteristic of human mental functioning. Second, the difference between these two types of capacity is merely actually a difference of stages along a continuum. The immediately exercisable capacity for mental functions is only the development of an underlying potentiality, a potentiality that the human being possesses by virtue of the kind of entity it is. The capacities for reasoning, deliberating, making choices, appreciating a joke, loving, entering into a relationship, appreciating art, and so forth, are gradually developed or brought forward toward maturation through gestation, childhood, adolescence, and into adulthood. But the difference between a being that deserves full moral respect and a being that does not and can therefore legitimately be killed for the benefit of others, as food, for example, or as spare parts, cannot consist only in the fact that while both have some feature, one has more of that feature than the other. A mere quantitative difference, having more or less of the same feature, such as the development of a basic natural capacity, cannot by itself be the justificatory basis for treating different entities in radically different ways. Treating one entity as so sacred that you can't kill it even to save a hundred other people, and treating another uh, entity as uh, something that can be killed for food or to make uh, products or uh, spare body parts. Third, the acquired qualities that could be proposed as criteria for personhood obviously come in varying and continuous degrees. There are an infinite number of degrees of the relevant developed abilities or dispositions, such as for self-consciousness or rationality or what have you. So if human beings were worthy of full moral respect only because of such qualities, then since such qualities do come in varying degrees, no account could be given of why basic rights are not possessed by human beings in varying degrees. The proposition that all human beings are equal in fundamental worth and dignity, despite any inequalities we have in intelligence or strength or beauty or ability, would be relegated to the status of a mere myth, maybe a, maybe a noble or not so noble lie. Since some people are more intelligent than others, have developed uh, a higher uh, level of rationality than others, some people would be greater in dignity than others if you counted rationality as the thing that really matters. And the rights of the superiors would trump those of the inferiors. This conclusion would follow no matter which of the acquired qualities proposed as qualifying some human beings or human beings at some developmental stages for full respect were the ones selected. And for uh, thinkers who um, do believe that it's the immediately exercisable uh, qualities and not the root radical natural, natural uh, capacities, uh, different uh, criteria have been proposed. There's no unanimity on exactly what it is, uh, except perhaps for the fact that it's got to be rooted somehow uh, in the concept of rationality. So it seems to me, it cannot be the case that some human beings and not others are intrinsically valuable by virtue of a certain degree of development, no matter what the, the, the quality that is, is supposed to be the thing that counts is, you know, rationality or the ability to develop uh, particular skills uh, or, or to be sociable or what have you. Rather, in my view, human beings are intrinsically valuable 
in the way that enables us to ascribe to them equality and basic rights, simply in virtue of what they are, that is the kind of being they are, rational animal organisms, creatures with a rational nature. And all human beings, on my view, are intrinsically valuable, which accounts for my belief, it's widely uh, shared, I think, still, but in any event, it is my belief that it would be wrong to, let's say, uh, uh, kidnap and kill uh, a mentally disabled uh, person, severely cognitively disabled uh, person, in order to uh, harvest, let's say, a pancreas uh, to save the life of a great scientist uh, or a uh, fabulous athlete uh, or a very beautiful uh, uh, model or uh, actress. Since human beings are intrinsically valuable and deserve full moral respect, in my view, in virtue of what they are, not how much of the quality they have, it follows that they are intrinsically and equally valuable from the point at which they come into existence. Even in the embryonic stage of our lives, each of us was a human being. That's a matter of biological fact. And as such, if I'm right on the ethical argument, worthy of concern and protection. Equal in worth and dignity to every other member of the human family. Embryonic human beings, and this is true whether they are brought into existence in the old-fashioned way by the union of gametes or by somatic cell nuclear transfer, cloning, should be accorded the respect given to human beings at other developmental stages, whatever that level of respect is. I have a view about that, but I, I'm not going to try to argue for that here because there's more to do on this particular question. OK, having laid out my affirmative case on the science and on the ethical principles, let me now turn to what I regard as the most compelling objections, at least that I've encountered, uh, to, to my uh, view and tell you uh, why uh, I think they fail. In defending research involving the destruction of human embryos, Ronald Bailey, who's a well-known science writer for Reason magazine, the libertarian magazine Reason, has developed an analogy, it's a very interesting one, between embryos and somatic cells. Somatic cells are just ordinary body cells, like skin cells. Uh, an analogy between uh, embryos and somatic cells, precisely in light of the possibility of cloning human beings, using SCNT technology to create new human beings. Bailey claims that every cell in the human body has as much potential for development as any human embryo. Embryos, therefore, have no greater dignity or higher moral status than ordinary somatic cells, like the skin cells that we rubber wash off our body every day. And here's the argument. Here's Bailey's argument. He observes that each cell in the body possesses the entire DNA code. That's true. Each has become specialized as muscle or skin or liver or blood or whatever by most of that code being turned off. In cloning, those portions of the code previously deactivated in the normal developmental process are reactivated by the lab technician or scientist. So, Bailey says, and he's quoting uh, the uh, Oxford bioethicist Julian Savulescu, quote, if all our cells could be persons, because they could be the, used in cloning to create new human beings, then we cannot appeal to the fact that an embryo could be a person to justify the special treatment we give it, unquote. So the form of the argument here is reductio ad absurdum. Since plainly we are not prepared to regard all of our cells as human beings, right? I, didn't, I don't think I killed a lot of human beings when I washed my hands this morning and rubbed the skin cells off. We shouldn't regard embryos as human beings either. Interesting analogy, right? It collapses, though, under scrutiny. The somatic cell is something from which, together with other extrinsic causes, the lab technicians work, for example, a new organism can be generated. It's certainly not, however, a distinct organism, a whole rather than the part of a larger organism. In the case of my skin, skin cells, the larger organism is me. A human embryo, by contrast, already is a distinct, self-developing, complete human organism, as every work of 
human embryology and developmental biology affirms. Bailey suggests that the somatic cell and the embryo are on the same level because both have, quote, the potential to develop to a mature human being. And this is a classic case of how an equivocation can be used to advance an argument. Because the kind of potentiality possessed by somatic cells that might be used in cloning differs profoundly from the potentiality of the embryo. A somatic cell has potential only in the sense that something can be done to it so that its constituents, its DNA molecules, enter into a distinct whole human organism, which would be a human being, a person. In the case of the embryo, by contrast, he or she, and sex is, developed, is uh, determined from the beginning in the human, is already actively, indeed dynamically, developing himself or herself to the further stages of maturity of the distinct organism, the human being that he or she already is. So the attempt at an analogy there really just turns on an equivocation. It's true that the whole genetic code is present in each somatic cell, and the code can be used for the guidance uh, of the growth of a new entire organism, a copy of you or a copy of me. But this point does nothing to show that its potentiality is the same as that of the embryo. When the nucleus of an ovum is removed, this is just the somatic cell nuclear transfer process, and a somatic cell is inserted into the remainder of the ovum, the ovular cytoplasm, and then given an electric stimulus, and then you have to say a prayer because most of the time this doesn't work. But when it does work, this does more than merely place the somatic cell in an environment hospitable to its continuing maturation and development. It generates a whole distinct, self-integrating, entirely new organism. You know what it generates? It generates an embryo. Uh, sometimes when I uh, lecture on uh, cloning, uh, people uh, will imagine that uh, in cloning, uh, subject A uh, is taken by the doctor uh, behind a screen, and then a few minutes pass, and out comes two subject A's exact adult copies. Of course, it doesn't work that way. Uh, what you generate uh, in the cloning process is the new human being in the embryonic stage. And then if, uh, presumably, no one's done it yet, that we know about, there have been claims of people who say they've done it, uh, especially in Italy, Professor Glendon, there are a couple of pranks who claim they've uh, done it. Uh, but you would have to, you would have to, uh, implant the embryo in the prepared uterus of a woman who gestates the uh, embryo and uh, produces the baby. The, enti the entity, the embryo brought into being by this process, is quite radically different from the constituents, like the contribution of the, uh, of the uh, uh, DNA from the somatic cell that entered into its generation. Now, uh, interestingly, uh, Professor Singer and his co-author, Agata Sagan, have attempted to rescue Bailey's uh, argument. Uh, Singer concedes that uh, very early on you have a new human being, but he thinks that you might be able to make out an argument like Bailey's to deny that you have a true human being at the earliest embryonic stage. Uh, he and Professor Sagan insist that the enucleated ovum, or ovular cyto ovular cytoplasm, is indeed only an environment, and so the fusion of a stem cell with it does not produce a new entity. For, they contend, if the nucleus of a stem cell were transferred to a different egg with different cytoplasm, this would not result, in their judgment, in a different embryo. They conclude, comparing embryos to stem cells rather than to somatic cells, a la Bailey, that, quote, it would seem that if the human embryo has moral standing and is entitled to protection in virtue of what it can become, then the same must be true of human embryonic stem cells. Un Quote, and of course, I don't believe, and nobody I know believes, that embryonic stem cells are living members of the human species, individuals of the human species, human beings. Uh, the objection, for those of us who have objections to embryonic stem cell research, is not to the destruction of stem cells. It's to the destruction of embryos to produce stem cells. As a matter of fact, uh, we've uh, been in the forefront of advocating technologies to create induced pluripotent cells, the exact equivalent the extent possible, of embryonic stem cells in ways that don't involve the destruction of a living human embryo. So the question is, it's interesting, is the ovular cytoplasm in the cloning case, 
merely a suitable environment enabling an already existing organism, the somatic cell or stem cell, to develop capacities already within it. That's what uh, uh, the, the Sagan Singer effort to rescue Bailey says. Or on the contrary, is it a cause or co-cause that produces a substantial change, what philosophers call a substantial change, conversion from one sort of thing into another, resulting uh, to be uh, in the coming to be of a new organism, uh, the embryo, which is, of course, my view. Now notice first that a new organism might be generated by the interaction of two causes, while it's possible that the same organism could have been generated by two different co-causes. Prior to the splitting of a flatworm, for example, a uh, flatworm is a species that uh, you can split without killing. So you split a flatworm. Prior to the splitting of the flatworm, you had a single flatworm. But any of various mechanical forces, like just a knife wielded by a human being, might produce two flatworms, where once there was one, and thus be the cause of the coming to be of new substances, new individuals. You had one individual, now you have two individuals. Thus the fact that the embryo could be produced by cloning with this enucleated ovum or with that one doesn't show that the enucleated ovum is a mere environment. Moreover, in the transformation of a stem cell into a whole organism when it's fused with the ovular cytoplasm, it's quite obvious that the cytoplasm is more than just a suitable environment and that the change is a coming to be of a new organism. And that's for two reasons. First, the stem cell was not a whole organism prior to its fusion, and absolutely nobody believes it was. Before its fusion, the cell functioned together with other parts of a larger organism for the survival and flourishing of that organism, the larger organism, not of itself, of the stem cell itself. It's knocked down scientific evidence. After the fusion, there is a new and complete whole organism, not a mere part. Second, something that qualifies as merely environmental does not enter into an organism and modify its internal parts, resulting in an entity with a new developmental trajectory, like a trajectory toward adulthood as a member of a particular species, rabbit, dog, human, what have you. But the ovular cytoplasm does precisely this in regard to the somatic cell or stem cell placed within it. The cytoplasm reprograms the cell inducing what philosophers call a substantial change. The crucial and decisive fact that that reprogramming takes place undermines the effort of Sagan and Singer to uh, rescue Bailey's argument. Uh, and uh, the decisive fact is that the uh, factors of the cytoplasm change the epigenetic state of what was hitherto a somatic cell or a stem cell or their nucleus. These factors modify the genes in ways for example, subtracting methyl groups from key molecules in the somatic cell's uh, DNA so that it becomes de-differentiated, which is to say it, it ceases to be a somatic cell at all, or stem cell, or part of a larger organism, like you know, part of your body, a skin cell that's part of your body. And instead, a new whole organism is produced in the form of a living embryonic member of the species. Somatic cells in the context of cloning, then, are analogous not to embryos, but to the gametes whose union results in generation of an embryo in the case of ordinary sexual reproduction. So here's the key thing. You and I, the adults living here today, were never a sperm cell or an ovum. If you trace your biography back to when things started happening to the organism that is you, you will not find that at one point you were an egg cell or a sperm cell. Nor would a person who was brought into being by the process of cloning have once been a somatic cell. To destroy an ovum or skin cell whose constituents might have been used to generate a new and distinct human organism by cloning or some other technology is not to destroy a new and distinct human organism, for no such organism existed or exists. But to destroy a human embryo is precisely to destroy a new and distinct and complete human organism, an embryonic human being. Now, let me introduce you, if you haven't learned, heard of this one, to another very interesting argument. It was advanced by um, a colleague of Professor Glendon's and mine when we were serving on the President's Council on Bioethics, the distinguished uh, neuroscientist Michael DeZaniga. While agreeing that a human embryo is an entity possessing a human genome, Dr. DeZaniga has suggested that a human being in the sense of a person comes into being only with the development of a brain. So this would be several weeks into of uh, embryonic development. It would still be fairly early, 
Uh, he thinks you have a human being fairly early when you get the brain development. But he thinks at least for a few weeks before you get brain development, you don't have a person. Prior to that point, you have a human organism, but one lacking the dignity and rights of a person. Human beings in the earliest stages of development, therefore, he thinks may be used as we would treat organs for transplantation. In presenting his case, Gazaniga observes the following. Here's the argument. Modern medicine treats the death of the brain as the death of the person, right? You've all heard of brain death? So if a human being is no longer a person with rights once the brain has died, then surely, he argues, a human being is not yet a person prior to the development of the brain. That sounds like a pretty plausible argument, doesn't it? After all, if we treat brain death as the person no longer exists, shouldn't we treat brain life as the criterion of personal existence? The argument suffers, however, from a damning defect. Under prevailing law and medical practice, developed as a matter of fact here at Harvard in the medical school, the rationale for brain death is not that a brain-dead body is a living human organism but no longer a person. Rather, brain death is accepted because the irreversible collapse of the brain, all the way down, is believed to destroy the capacity for self-directed integral organic functioning of human beings who have matured to a stage at which the brain plays the major role in integrating the organism. In other words, at brain death, there is no longer a unitary organism at all, even if mechanically parts of the systems of the uh, organism are being maintained. By contrast, although an embryo has not yet developed a brain, at least for a few weeks, it's clearly exercising from the very beginning self-directed integral organic functioning, the thing that's the actual criterion of life, even in the case of brain death. And so it is a unitary organism, which no one can deny, an embryonic human being. Its capacity to develop a brain is inherent and developing just as the capacity of an infant to develop its brain sufficiently for it to actually think is not there yet, but is inherent and developing. The capacity is there, but the exercise, exercisability of the capacity is not there, but it's inherent and developing. Unlike a corpse, the remains of what was once a human organism but is now dead, a human organism in the embryonic stage of development is a complete, unified, self-integrating human individual. And once again, every work of human embryology and developmental biology attests to that. It's not dead, but very much alive, even though its self-integration and organic functioning are not brain-directed at the early stage. It is a living, growing, developing entity. Its future lies ahead of it unless it is cut off. Uh, now I want to turn to another important argument. This one is advanced also by a former colleague of uh, Professor Glendon's and mine and a good friend of ours. Uh, who's here at Harvard, Professor Michael Sandel uh, in the government department. Uh, Professor Sandel claims that human embryos are different in kind, again, at least in the earliest stages, from human beings at later developmental stages, the fetal stage, the infant stage, and so forth. And his argument really takes us to the heart of the matter. Is a human embryo, even in the earliest stages, a human being? At its core, uh, Sandel's argument uh, relies on an analogy. It's a familiar one. He says, and I quote him, although every oak tree was once an acorn, it doesn't follow that acorns are oak trees or that I should treat the loss of an acorn eaten by a squirrel in my front yard as the same kind of loss as the death of an oak tree felled by a storm. Despite their developmental continuity, acorns and oak trees are different kinds of things. Now, notice uh, what uh, Professor Sandel is conceding, rightly, uh, to uh, my argument, that there is, in fact, developmental continuity between the acorn and the oak tree. They are the same organism. There was nothing that Lotzberg has called substantial change. Nothing changed the nature of the entity, although he still wants to argue they are different kinds of things. How do we know that? He wants to say it's evident in our reactions, our very different reactions to the loss of uh, an acorn eaten by a squirrel, which we don't treat as anything very serious, and the felling in a storm of a magnificent uh, oak tree that we have uh, admired. 
So Sandel maintains that just as acorns are not oak trees, embryos are not human beings, or at least human beings with dignity. But Sandel's argument fails, and it fails in a way that highlights the basic error in supposing that human embryos lack fundamental worth or dignity and may therefore legitimately be relegated to the status of disposable research material or spare parts or what have you. Professor Sandel's argument begins to go awry precisely with his choice of analogous. The acorn is analogous to the embryo, and the oak tree, he says, is analogous to the human being. But in view of that developmental continuity that science fully establishes, and Sandel rightly concedes, the proper analogate of the oak tree is the mature human being, the adult. Now, of course, Sandel's analogy has its apparent force because we really do feel a sense of loss, ordinarily, when a mature oak is felled. We appreciated the, the grandeur, the magnificence of the oak. But while it's true that we do not feel the same sense of loss at the destruction of an acorn, it's also true that we don't feel the same sense of loss at the destruction of an oak, oak sapling. But clearly, the oak tree does not differ in kind from the oak sapling. This shows that we value oak trees not because of the kind of entity they are, but rather because of their magnificence, an accidental quality. Either acorn, neither acorns nor saplings are magnificent. So we don't experience a, sauce, a sense of loss when they are destroyed. If oak trees were valuable in virtue of the kind of entity they are, then it would follow that it's just as unfortunate to lose an acorn as an oak. But the basis for valuing human beings is profoundly different. It's not on the basis of the magnificence or any accidental quality. We may admire a Michael Jordan or an, or an Albert Einstein uh, or a George Clooney or whoever you want to think. We admire a particular magnificent example of a human being for the magnificence. But we don't think that the value of the human being lies, the fundamental value, the inviolability, the moral worth lies in that magnificence. It lies in the fact that that is a member of the human family. As Sandel concedes, we value human beings precisely because, because of the kind of entity they are. I, I, this are Oh, we have the room for like one more minute. Oh, OK. All right. I'll wrap this up. Uh, indeed, that's why we consider all human beings to be equal in worth and dignity. We most certainly do not consider that especially magnificent human beings, Michael Jordan, Albert Einstein, are of greater fundamental and inherent worth than human beings who are physically frail or mentally or cognitively impaired. We would not tolerate the killing of a mentally disabled child or a person suffering from, say, brain cancer in order to ar uh, harvest transplantable organs to save Jordan or Einstein. Uh, I would have concluded, if we had more time, by answering uh, a familiar objection some of you may have heard that appeals to uh, the fact that in the very earliest stages of embryonic development, a monozygotic twinning can, can occur, well, identical twins uh, can occur. The embryo can split, or uh, as scientists now tend to think, there can be a budding of an embryo, so now you have two, a kind of natural form of human cloning. And some people argue that because twinning is possible, at least for those first seven, eight, nine days, at least at that stage, you don't yet have a human individual because it could be two individuals. And I have an argument to uh, refute that. It begins by calling attention to the fact that we can split a flatworm, uh, you get two flatworms, but no one would argue in virtue of the fact that you can create two flatworms from one flatworm that before the splitting of the flatworm, you didn't have an actual whole living complete individual flatworm. But there's more to that. I'll be happy to send you my remarks so that you can go back over them and uh, read the, uh, the critique of uh, twinning. You can, you can get me there. Also happy to entertain any challenges. And I thank you for your kind attention and staying for the whole hour. You're really very nice to do that. Thank you. And thank you for the Thank show. you.